Because you're in San Diego, I have to start with your time in Coronado. Sure. Please tell me about it. Well, I got here in 1977. It's when I started Class 95, the Navy SEAL training over in Coronado. And, uh, and I'm fortunate tonight at the event uh, we're doing, uh, the guy that was my class leader uh, at the time, Lieutenant Junior Grade Daniel Stewart, will be here. Uh, and I've got a lot of close friends that are still here in Coronado. Uh, but yeah, started my Navy career here in San Diego and then uh, was fortunate enough to spend my early days here at Underwater Demolition Team 11. And then the next 37 years kind of took me all over the world. Wow. Trained here and then as a SEAL stationed here as well. Right. So my first duty station was at Underwater Demolition Team 11, which was over in Coronado, no longer there anymore. Um, and then after that, I did a tour in the Philippines. But then all of my command tours, as we refer to them, so I was commanding officer SEAL Team 3 and Naval Special Warfare Group 1, uh, both uh, in Coronado, and, uh, and we just, uh, my wife and I kind of raised our kids here. Two of my kids were born here at Balboa. Uh, so it's, uh, San Diego is a special place for us. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. How much time combined with those do you think you lived here? Yeah, in? so probably 10 years. I have a 37-year career, about 10 years we're here in San Diego. That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. At various times. Uh, which was nice because we would, you know, start off in San Diego, we'd move away, come back a few years later, a couple of years here, and then up to Monterey, then back here, and then to Tampa, and then back here. So it, it was always good. San Diego was always like coming home. And uh, I live in Texas now, short flight out here, but every time we come back, uh, it is a special place. Oh, it's really nice to hear. It's great. Wisdom of the Bullfrog, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Incredible book. Some of the chapters are when in doubt, overload, right. who dares wins, but what is your favorite chapter and why? Yeah, I think my favorite chapter is the story about can you stand before the long green table? So uh, as I, I, I tell the story, um, but the background is when I was a young officer uh, here at, in, uh, in Coronado, at some point in time, one of the more senior officers who had been a Vietnam vet, I was getting ready to do something and he said, Bill, always ask yourself, can you stand before the long green table and justify your actions? And the history of it is, back in World War II, the Navy had these conference rooms and the conference rooms had a long, you know, kind of boardroom table, but it always had a thin layer of felt, green felt on top of it. And the implication was, look, your actions and your decisions if you ever had a formal review, you would have to stand before the men and women that were behind that table and explain to them your actions. So throughout my career, every time I was getting ready to make a difficult decision or, a, or take a difficult action, I would say, okay, would reasonable men and women think this was the right thing to do? Could I justify my actions? And that I learned very early on and it served me well in my you know, 40 years of leadership. It's a great thing to think about standing in front of that table. <laughs> You have both been a frogman and led frogmen, but what are the differences in the qualities that it takes to do those? You know, there's, there's one quality that, sets, that, that is common to all frogmen, and that's when, when we went through SEAL training, we didn't quit. I mean, it sounds simple, but you realize in the course of your career, uh, you're gonna have an opportunity to quit a thousand times. We ask a lot of our Navy SEALs, our frogmen, you know, they move every couple of years, their families have to move with them. Of course, after 9-11, they're in combat constantly. There's always the opportunity to give up. And I think going through SEAL training, the fact that you didn't quit means you're not gonna quit on SEAL training, you're not gonna quit on your family, you're not gonna quit on your teams, you're not gonna quit on your country. It's in a, a very important kind of core quality to who we are. Because when you go through SEAL training, that's about the only thing that's common. You know, different ethnic backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, different sizes, different colors. But the one thing in common we have is we didn't quit. I love that. Anything that you had to master to lead them, though? You know, the, uh, the, the thing you have to recognize when you're leading, I think anybody, it's not just about Navy SEALs or frogmen, because I've had the opportunity to lead a lot of people, is at the end of the day, your job as a leader is to earn the respect of the men and women that you're serving. And it is about this idea of servant leadership. You know, we forget sometimes that the role of the leader is to get the job done by inspiring, by motivating, sometimes by a little tough love, but you've got to pull the group together to get them to accomplish a job. And the way you do that is you have to earn their respect. I tell folks in 37 years of being in the military, I never once 
uh, issued an order. In other words, I am ordering you to do this. I never said that. People understand that it is an implied order, but you've got to be able to sit down with them and explain why you're going out on this complicated, this tough mission, why you're asking them to do these things. So there is a lot of inspiration, there is a lot of management, there is a lot of earning their respect. And you earn their respect by hard work, you show up early, you work hard, you stay late, you come in on the weekends. I think nothing earns the respect of the sailors that you serve more than showing them that you're prepared to share the hardships, share the danger, do the hard work with them. That's amazing. And from a midshipman to a four-star admiral, I mean, it's incredible. <laughs> but what are the most important habits, choices, skills that you possess that made that possible? You know, I like to think I listen. And very early on, uh, the officer that kind of took me under his wing when I got to underwater demolition team 11 was a guy named John Wright. And he was a Navy lieutenant, had served in Vietnam. And you know, we didn't call him mentors back then, but that's kind of what he was. And he took me under his wing. And I remember the first bit of advice he gave me when I got to the team, he said, go listen to the command master chief. Sit at the feet of the command master chief and hear what the enlisted men think they need from their officers. And this idea that every time I went to a new command, it was go listen to the sailors, listen to the SEALs, and then when I was in charge of a, of a large army contingent, go talk to the command, ma command sergeant major, listen. Listen and you will find out a lot. Now, at the end of the day, as a leader, you've got to make hard decisions. Um, and you find, again, if you've earned the respect of the troops, if you've listened to the troops, those decisions are a lot easier to make. That's amazing. I was going to ask you about the quality of um, you know, the actual SEALs themselves, but you've kind of mentioned that they don't quit. You didn't quit. say the strongest one, you didn't say... Nope. In this fact, it's morning? not. It's rarely the strongest and the fastest or the smartest, interestingly enough. Uh, it's that person that has the determination to make it through SEAL training. Um, and, I mean, I, I guarantee you I was never the smartest man in the, in the room. Uh, and I wasn't the fastest and I wasn't the strongest. Uh, I was fortunate enough always to be around, you know, great uh, enlisted men, great officers that kind of helped me through the rough times. Um, but it is this quality of determination it is also, of course, a quality of you know, critical thinking and being a good teammate. These things are very important. I mean, we're called the SEAL teams for a reason because you've got to work together as a team. As I've said before, you, know, you can be the, the strongest, the fastest, the smartest SEAL in the little rubber boat, but at the end of the day, it takes everybody to paddle that boat. Everybody's got to work together, and that's something you have to do as a leader. You've got to pull the people together to get the job done. Military has a lot of sayings and mottos, things like that. Do you have a personal motto that you like kind of pull out and there's your motto? Well, I put it in the book, interestingly enough, and it's a, it's a new one, but I think it really encompasses, you know, what I knew as an officer uh, my, my whole career. And it's a quote by Pope Francis that says, a shepherd should smell like his sheep. A shepherd should smell like his sheep. And again, it's a relatively new quote, but I think every great officer, every great enlisted person I was around, and I was fortunate in my career to serve with some tremendous leaders. But they all understood at the end of the day that they had to go to the foxhole or you know, spend time in the boiler room or you know, be down where the reactor was. The great leaders um, put themselves in harm's way. They get down with the troops, and particularly during 9-11, or after 9-11, in Iraq and Afghanistan when I worked for General Dave Petraeus and uh, you know, General Ray Odierno and uh, Lloyd Austin and, and Stan McChrystal, I would watch these great, in this case, Army officers, but Jim Mattis in the case of, of the Marine Corps, and I would watch them go into Ramadi or go into Fallujah or go into Kabul or go out into the Hindu Kush and spend time with their soldiers. And this was the idea of you need to smell like your sheep. You can't spend your time in your office. You can't you know, be drinking coffee while the men and women are doing the hard work. You've got to get down, you've got to find out what their challenges are, you have to spend time with them, or you're likely to make bad decisions. So I always liked uh, that one. But of course, the SEAL mantra is, the only easy day was yesterday. And I think that's incredibly important too, because it really means that you got to bring it every day. Every day that you're a leader, you got to come to work, you got to be prepared to work as hard as possible. Yesterday was hard, today will be even harder. If you think your easy days are behind you, 
Or if you think because you're senior that somehow you, know, you deserve certain perks and you need to, you're mistaken. It's an honor to lead and therefore come to work every day prepared to give it your all. It's a great chapter in the book, by the way. You obviously have commanded the operations, including Saddam Hussein, uh, you know, Osama bin Laden. But what qualities do you rely on in those kind of make or break right. decisions that maybe you could, that we could all possess when it came to our lives and the, the decisions and the endeavors that we're all trying? Yeah, you know, for, for the, the really challenging missions, um, you hope that in this case, the, the SEALs or the soldiers that were working for me are critical thinkers and they can think on their feet. I mean, it's really important because the, the nature of combat is always changing. You can build the best plan, and we, as we say, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. In other words, you may have plan A, and I think I've got a Taylor Swift quote in there that says, <laughs> just because you build a plan doesn't mean that's how it's gonna turn out. And, and of course that's true. Everybody that ever had a plan understands that here's plan A, you better have plan B and you better have plan C. But you also need people that can look at a situation and think on their feet and go, okay, I know how I've been trained, this is what I'm gonna do, right? I think in terms of people's personal lives, um, it, it sounds kind of crazy, but, it, but this, this idea of making your bed, uh, the kind of the first task of the day, having a little order in your life. I always tell folks that, you know, when I talked about making your bed, uh, I think in my 2014 speech, I talked about the fact that it was, you know, the first uh, you know, task of the day, but it was also about, um, you know, making sure that you understood the little things in life counted. But later on in my career, when I was in Afghanistan, I lived in a small room uh, made by the Navy Seabees, and I was a three-star admiral. It was just a room about half the size of the stage, and there was a bed in it. And every morning I'd get up, I'd go do my PT in the gym, I'd come back, I'd make the bed before I walked outside. Because outside that plywood room, it was the environment of combat. Uh, unfortunately, guys died in combat, civilians would inadvertently be killed. Somebody was always yelling at me about something. <laughs> and outside the plywood door, it was a challenge. My days were long and sometimes I'd be gone multiple days, but when I came back, the bed was made. And it gave me a small sense of control of my life. And that sounds simple, maybe it sounds, I don't know, sophomoric or, or silly, but I have found for people in challenging times, whatever you're going through, um, having a little sense of order, something that you can control, making your bed, but there's probably other things that say, okay, I've got this. You go away, you come back, your room's clean, your bed's made, you have some sense of order, some sense of control. It really does help then when you're dealing with the bigger challenges of the day. That is really incredible. What's next for you? If <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, next is uh, I've got uh, a wedding coming up next week. Uh, my daughter's getting married, uh, and uh, my wife and I, after that, are going off on our 45th wedding anniversary. So, uh, so a couple of big weeks coming up. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. I actually, my daughter's wedding is June 17th. Oh, very so nice. I, I Where, understand. Here? Ojai, the small oh, yeah. town. Very just, nice. You know where it is? I know, kind of, of Santa Barbara, Ventura. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. So that's really great. That's wonderful Thanks. for your family. Anything that you would add? I tried not to just ask you about every chapter of the book, but uh, yeah. I also don't want to leave something out. No, you know, it's uh, like I said, uh, as we started off, San Diego and Coronado always have a special place in my heart. I said two of my three children were born here. This is always like coming home. And, uh, and of course today, uh, your audience probably doesn't know this, but of course today it's just a gorgeous day out and it's, uh, it is always fun to be back, great friends. In terms of leadership, um, I've got a quote at the end of the book um, and it, it tells the story of uh, the Spartans at Thermopylae. So it's an old historical story, you know, 480 BC, Xerxes the Great is coming across and there's this great book by Stephen Pressfield called The Gates of Fire. And it talks about the 300 Spartans that held off uh, the Persians. And all the Persians, I mean, all the Spartans are killed except for one man. And, and Xerxes the Great brings the one surviving Spartan back to find out why did the Spartans fight so hard? And King Leonidas was the Spartan that led them. And, um, and so he's got the lone Spartan left. He said, why did they fight so hard? 
And in Pressfield's book, he says, uh, well, the king does not abide in his tent while his men bleed and die on the battlefield. The king does not dine while his men go hungry. The king does not sleep while his men stand watch upon the wall. The king does not earn the respect of his men through gold or through fear. The king earns their love through the sweat of his back and the pain he endures on their behalf. The king is the first to lift the heaviest burden and the last to put it down. And I think that quote um, is emblematic of all great leaders. They're the ones that pick up the heaviest load first and the last to put it down. And that, uh, again, so it's a fictional account of the Battle of Thermopylae, but I think it's a, a great, great leadership lesson. Ah, oh, it's incredible. Well, thank you. Oh, my this pleasure.